Monday, October 15th, Common Council meeting. Will the clerk read the quote of the day? I'd be happy to. You cannot live a perfect day without doing something for someone who will never be able to repay you. Thank you. We call, can we call the roll, please? Here, here. 15 present. There's a quorum present. Alderman Van Akron is excused. Will Alderman Versi please lead us in the pledge of allegiance? I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Approval of the minutes, Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to approve the minutes of the previous council meeting. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of the previous council meeting. Is there any changes or discussion? Hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Fifteen ayes. Motion carried. Mayor's appointments, Steve. Honorable members of the council, I hereby submit the following appointment for your consideration. Amy Horst to be considered for appointment to the Redevelopment Authority to fill the unexpired term of Mark Miller, whose term expires 4-28-2014, signed by the mayor. That will lie over. Tonight, we have a presentation from Ed Huck of 1,000 Friends of Wisconsin. Ed, if you'd like to come up. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, um, 10 years ago when I was executive director of the Wisconsin Alliance of Cities in conjunction with the Counties Association, the League of Wisconsin Municipalities, and the, um, the Alliance of Cities, a thousand friends, we created this fair share coalition because we could see that there was something happening with uh, local um, reimbursements to local government for uh, road assistance over the five years at that time from 97 until 2002. Uh, we made a mistake 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we did not come to the councils. We did not talk to the councils about what was going on. And consequently, when your legislators talk to you folks, talk to the mayor, um, they didn't really know all of that, what was going on. And uh, things continued the way that they have been continuing for the last, uh, for 10 years thereafter. So um, what I'm doing now, I'm, I'm traveling around the state, I'm stopping at a, a whole lot of council meetings talking about this particular issue because it's gotten to be quite a serious situation. So we are, we call ourselves the Fair Share Coalition as before, and I hope I pushed the right button because if things continue, we see some bad roads ahead, if you excuse the pun. So user fees for user fees like the gas tax and registration fees, most people think that that's what pays for state roads, state highways, and local roads. But as you folks know here, that that's a myth. That's, that's not what happens. What happens around, on average, with municipalities, 80% of the cost of maintaining and policing uh, local roads in the state are paid for either by property taxes or by fees or by uh, transfers from the state like shared revenues. The fact is there's a crisis on the horizon, uh, if it isn't already here, uh, as it relates to local roads. And, uh, the situation is that, um, that most of the revenues are currently going to state and federal highways, which means that there's stress at the local level. But more importantly is that uh, we're, we're actually collecting less money at the state. 
Uh, there's a commission that's been put together by Governor Walker, headed up by Secretary Gottlieb, to look at the gap between highway or maintenance, um, local roads, the needs. The, just on the maintenance end of it, they project a uh, balance It's going to cost another $5 billion more in revenues just to maintain the highway lane miles that we have. They don't have that money. In addition, if they take all the needs, local, state, bridges, all of that, they're looking at a gap somewhere between four and $15 billion. So there's a, a very serious financial situation. Well, needs, however, are a relative thing. But the reason for this is we're driving less, for one. Uh, in the last five years, vehicle miles traveled have actually declined in Wisconsin, twice. And we're driving more efficient cars, um, or at least we will be at some point. My car's, are, my car's 10 and 15 years old, but when the dog dies, I'm going to get a new car, and it will be more efficient than the two that I currently have. And so will it be um, through Wisconsin. So the combination of those two, the projections from the committee are looking at flat revenues over the next 10 years. So no new revenue growth in the fund compared to the needs that will be adding up over that time. So that means less in the transportation fund, more spending on highways. You can start to see where this thing is heading. So two things. First is the, first, the, the middle line, the lower one, is what's happened with road aids as a percent of the budget. Um, 15 years ago, 40% of the fund went back to local government in some way, shape, or form. Today, that's 30%. And at the same time, in terms of highways, when you can add in debt service, 61% of the revenues are going for highways. What's worse than that is debt. $781 million have been committed in the next budget for debt service. This is borrowed money to expand highways that's already spent, and this, the debt service is $781 million for the two-year cycle. That's a significant amount. That's 12% of the entire revenues uh, of, by the state are going for debt service. So, the statutes say that local governments can get 85% of their costs um, from user fees paid for at the local level. So what happened in 2010? Towns got 37% of their costs, counties got 20% of their costs, and cities and villages got 17% of their costs. 15 years ago, you were at around 25% of your costs being paid for. So you can see the decline in what has been going on. It's a combination of your costs going up and the revenues not keeping pace with those costs. <clears throat> so the shortfall uh, continues. 90% of all roads in Wisconsin are local roads. 90%. 30% of the revenues. Highways are 10% of the roads, including debt service, 62% of the revenues. And this can be um, even with the cuts that came down in the last budget, highway spending went up $400 million where everything else was cut. Everything else was cut. So one of the questions is, should we allocate the money based on vehicle miles traveled, which is a, it's a valid discussion. Well, right now, 60% are driven on highways. I think one of the interesting things I found out in doing my research, less than 18% of vehicle miles traveled in Wisconsin are on interstates. Less than 18%. That's, a, that's a, kind of a startling figure. 
40% vehicle miles traveled are on local roads. But we're getting 30% of the funds. And by the way, that 30% of the funds includes transit aid, um, uh, connecting highway aids uh, as well. So in terms of just general aids, it's even less than the 30%. So while highway spending is going down, or highway driving is going down, and more driving is happening at local roads, the combination of more spending on highways and less on local roads is quite puzzling. In fact, Wisconsin is 11, 11th in the nation in terms of dedicating money to new highway capacity, even though our population growth is figured to grow at half of the national average, which is kind of an interesting um, scenario. So what's going on? What happened in the last budget? Shared revenues were cut 7%. General transportation aid, 6%. Transit operating, 10%. Recycling aids down 40%. Your taxable property has either been stagnant in terms of value or declining, which puts uh, uh, pressure on rates. And we all know how folks feel about their property tax rates. So the levy limits were made per, uh, permanent. And so the, the question is, what are the options for local government? The average expenditures for local road support in, um, in municipalities around Wisconsin is about 20% of your budget. So this is no small matter. This isn't something that you can just brush <coughs> It's with stormwater, police, um, and just the uh, deterioration of your local roads. Somewhere around 43% of local roads are less, in less than good condition uh, on average in Wisconsin. So, now we're not gonna return to these old days, although there's a couple of roads up in Ashland that the, the mayor tells me could look that way. But this is a, a, a serious situation in this sense. Local roads need to be safe in terms in the cities, they need to be safe in rural areas. And this is not what you want in terms of economic development. And I'll, I'll bet every spring the Sheboygan Press does a story on potholes. Uh, I'll, put, I'll put my money on it. In fact, uh, there are newspapers that always show me the potholes that you've got in your cities. It's, it's, the fact is that any truck, I mean, we need good highways. I'm not saying that we don't. But every truck that, that travels on a highway leaves that highway and it finds um, some type of a, an, a, a collector or arterial to deliver their goods within a city or a village or a town because the economy doesn't happen on the highway. The economy happens in, mostly in the cities, but it also in the rural areas. I mean, what's going on in some of the counties, the frac sand on the western part uh, of the state, what that's doing to county highways is just obliterating them. Bridges <coughs> are under tremendous stress in the rural areas because of the, uh, the lax, uh, the, the lumber coming down and, and other uh, large bulk uh, materials that are being shipped uh, or, or coming into the Green Bay Harbor or coming into uh, the Milwaukee Harbor. A lot of bulk goods coming in and then coming over those roads. So, the reality of it is we need balance in Wisconsin, and we currently do not have balance. We have, for 15 years, focused on highway expansion and lane mile expansion for highways. That has been the focus. Um, other states are looking at what the federal government is likely to do. Wisconsin projects as much as a billion dollars less in federal revenue um, coming into the state. Uh, in addition, to the fact that state revenues are flat. So if the highway spending continues and revenues remain flat or are declining, there's only one target um, and it happens to be local government. And the impact on you folks could be quite significant and quite severe. Because the fact of the matter is, what that would mean is you'd wind up borrowing. In order to get around the levy limits, you'd wind up borrowing. 
you'd wind up going the debt route the same as the state of Wisconsin has gone the debt route. And frankly, that's not sustainable. That is, that is not sustainable. So what's going on? The two big highway projects, there's, um, there's $4 billion committed to those projects already. That, that money is committed. And that's for the I-39 between Illinois and, uh, and Janesville and I-94 between the Illinois line and uh, uh, north of Kenosha. They're getting 60% of the revenues currently. We're getting one third and that's where the name comes, <clears throat> the Fair Share Coalition. What we're considering, because our legislative efforts have not been um, successful, is a constitutional amendment. Now, this may sound radical, but it really isn't. Ratios are not uncommon in state constitutions. The state of Illinois has a ratio between personal income tax and corporate income tax, uh, as an example. So what we're suggesting is that half of state revenues that come from the people that drive in, from the cities, the towns, counties, villages, uh, come back to local governments. And so what I'm here tonight is to ask the council to consider passing a resolution in support of a constitutional amendment. Minimally, uh, the League of Municipalities has a position uh, coming up this month that asks for 24% of the cost of local governments to be uh, sent back from the state, um, which is a, a pretty significant increase in itself. So between the League of Municipalities or what we're advocating for, what we are saying is that it is critical for local governments to find some balance so that you folks can deal with your local roads through user fees, not from property taxes, not from borrowing, not from new fees, um, which is pretty much what the legislature has left you good folks uh, with, um, or something of this nature. So the politics of the last 15 years has been to uh, take the, what it would appear anyway, is that as debt has been going up, local aids have been going down. That, that seems to be the scenario that has occurred. And the state is looking at shortfalls and if they continue their spending habits on new lane miles, that means more debt and more pressure for local aids. So this is a serious situation. This is no small matter, and it's come to a peak. So the question that we're asking, now there are states like Pennsylvania that are looking at every highway project that they had on the books that they thought they needed, and they scrubbed $5 billion in projects, they said, that were not critical to the economy of the state. And so this commission that the governor has is looking at revenues. It's looking at only one side of the equation. There is an assumption that everything else is okay. And the fact of the matter is everything else is not okay. Because e I don't know how many people here would support a significant increase in the gas tax or some new fee um, or a huge jump in the registration fee. I don't, <coughs> see that, I don't see that happening. I don't see the state legislature doing that. So if they don't do that, what are they going to do? And what we're suggesting is they invest in what they have. They make sure that what they have works. And that would mean that local governments would have to see a significant increase in, in, their, in their aid. So I'm here to ask you to take some action. Now I've left uh, with your uh, city clerk some copies of a potential resolution as well as um, copies of the resolution that was passed by Ashland and by uh, West Allis as an example of what those two cities have done. So uh, I, I could answer some questions if, uh, if the mayor would wish me to do that or council. 
All right. Thank well, you, Ed. I thank you for your time. Thank you. <coughs> City Clerk, the public forum. Evening, we have Frank Kozan. I'm going to forego the microphone. Okay, and Frank, I need your home address, please. Uh, you may go, let me get me my thing here, and I will get you going. Um, go ahead. You'll have five minutes. I'm assisted by my wife, Mary Cozan, and uh, this originated as an inquiry regarding school uh, issues. I realized school district employees who contribute to the retirement fund are no different than municipal employees that contribute to the retirement fund. So that's why I'm presenting it here, and I'd like to begin. Now that teachers, municipal workers, contribute half to the retirement system, your school district, municipality, has higher payroll costs and your tax bill goes up thanks to that temper. That's right, when teachers, municipal employees, pay nothing, the school district, municipality, has lower payroll costs and your tax bill goes down. This is not smoke and mirrors. An example, an illustrative salary of 10,000, not realistic, but makes the math easy. Social Security is really 6.2, here rounded is 6%. Medicare is really 1.45, rounded to 2%. Uh, retirement fund contributions are 5.9%, here rounded to 6%. And zilch is what currently the district or municipality pays towards the uh, teacher's part of retirement. When you add this up, it's $11,400. Consider next year, let's say there's a 3% increase to account for inflation. Now, from 10,000 to go to 10 to 300, every category increases. This is still zilch, they're still not paying the teachers or municipal workers part. It's now 11,742. But what happens if the union, whether teachers union or municipal workers union, accepts no raise in exchange for something else? What is that something else? No raise? That $300, that was the 3% increase, is over here. Now the district or municipality pays the $300 portion of the total. And when you add these things up, because look, this is still 10,000. This has not risen, this has not risen, this has not risen. The sum total is 11,700. 11,700 is less than 11,742. And the district, municipality, saves money. This is not smoke and mirrors, folks. Look at those figures again. 11,742, district, municipality, forbidden by Act 10 to pay that, uh, that share. 11,700, the district, municipality is permitted. $42 per savings per 10,000 per teacher. Let's see what happens in uh, with the real salary in the mid-sized district. Real estate salary, 40,000 average, superintendent custodian. $42 per 1,000 times four, because that's how you get to 40,000, is 168 savings per teachers. 168 savings per teachers times 700 teachers, about Sheboygan size. Drum roll, please. $117,600 the first year savings to the mid sized district. <coughs> that savings for the district, municipality, and a lower tax bill for you in just the first year, and there's more savings each and every year, savings that increase. 
Does the impact, on the, I'll show you the next last page, over 12 years on a mid-sized district, 700 employees, 40,000 average. Here, only 1.5% increase, not 3%. Cumulative savings over 12 years, $2,891,501. Through the state, we could say there's 70,000. That's 100 times uh, uh, 700 um, uh, teachers or uh, district employees. That comes at $289,150,100. Act 10 is not a tool for saving districts or municipalities money. And as of 12-31-11, uh, it's required by re report uh, of uh, the 2011 Act 32. Active participants, teachers, municipal workers, judges, protective services are 260,711. That is nearly 70, 372 times 700 and 2,891,501 2, times 372 equals 1,075,638,372. That's over 12 years, averaging nearly 90 million per year. You say that's a stunning number, how can it be? Well, folks, if you can save $28 per month per person, that's $36 per year per active uh, person. So, uh, uh, so uh, in over 12 years, that's $4,032 savings per active <laughs> participant. 4,032 per active participants at Titans, 260,711 is 1,051,186,752. Actually, this comes out to about $20.75. And guess what? On the last page, I'll show you that when the teachers pay nothing, they pay more federal income tax, not much. They pay more Wisconsin income tax. Not much, but nobody's going to say that they're getting a free ride and they're not paying their share of the Wisconsin tax or the federal tax. And they agree to no raise for several years. Why would they agree to no raise? They end up with more money in their pocket. Impossible? No. The math is math. Hold on, Frank. That's it. <laughs> okay. I could show you a little bit more. If anybody doubts it, I'll be available to show you the numbers and... I'm going to be at the Meat Library Rocker Room Wednesday in the afternoon, Thursday in the morning. Anyone wants to touch me, this is here. I also have sheets that have your representatives and state representatives and state senators' numbers. Perhaps you should ask them, what were they thinking when they passed this act? It costs money. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Frank. Anyone else on the... Uh, Daryl, could you pull the podium back for me? Uh, yes, we have one other person. Uh, Dulcie Johnson, please. <coughs> Dulcie, can you get in there? Okay. Dulcie, can I have your home address, please? 1306. North 3rd Street, Sheboygan. <clears throat> we have five minutes. Mayor Van Akron, City Clerk Richards, City Attorney McLean, Aldermen, and citizens. On September 4th, I spoke at the public forum about ambulance revenues for 2011, the 41% collection rate, and the marginal loss of over $300,000. On September 17th at the public forum, Chief Administrative Officer Amodio spoke about setting the record straight. But in rebutting the figures I presented for 2011 revenues, Mr. Amodio cited ambulance revenues for 2012. I never mentioned 2012. I only spoke about 2011. Mr. Amodio also disputed my statement that the city's collections for 2011 were 41% of what was billed and stated that collections were 77%. I was not at the council meeting on the 17th, but I watched a rerun of the meeting and emailed Mr. Amodio with my response, noting that the finance department chooses to consider adjustments when they calculate the percentage of receipts, even though the city does not receive the adjustments. In response to my email, <clears throat> Mr. Amodio stated, and I quote, your 41% is correct. However, it must be put into context. Medicare and Medicaid pay only pay on average 38% of the amount billed. The most the city could collect is 58% of all claims billed. This 58% compared to 41% does not take into consideration the 90 to 120 day payment lag. End of quote. 
On August 21st, <clears throat> I had emailed a Freedom of Information Act request to Nancy Buss in the Finance Department, requesting a copy of the billing service provider activity for calls from January 1st, 2011 through December 31st, 2011. The wording of my request was identical to the request I made last year for 2010 figures. Last year, the information I received included the number of calls, gross billings, adjustments, receipts, and the percentage of collections and adjustments. <coughs> this year, in response to an identical request, I only received a listing of the number of calls each month. <clears throat> I don't know why I didn't receive the complete information, but I did indeed find the information I was seeking in my files. Mr. Amodio said that my calculation of 41% did not include the 90 to 120 day lag receipts. The billing collection information I received from Mr. Amodio when I met with him and Chief Herman does not indicate payments for 2011 billings, so I don't know where or how that information is recorded. Mr. Amodio said that the most the city can collect is 58% of all claims, so I asked him why he said collections were 77%. In response, Mr. Amodio said, and I quote, <clears throat> for net collections, we are collecting 77% of the 58% without considering the lag in payments. This is why it is very misleading. Let me repeat that. For net collections, we are collecting 77% of the 58% without considering the lag in payments. This is why it is very misleading. Misleading. That is an understatement. How do potential maximum collections of 58% result in net collections of 77%? Would a private business consider what they could have collected or adjustments that they had to write off as part of their income? I think not. I have never learned new math. I only learned good old-fashioned arithmetic and billings of $2,153,813 and receipts of $877,452 results in a collection rate of 41%. I am hard pressed to believe that the lag receipts would raise that percentage to 77%. Indeed, although billings and receipts for 2010 were lower, when I add the collections for 2010 billings received in 2011, the percentage of billings for 2010 with the 90 to 120 day lag is only 42%. Some have called the city's ambulance <coughs> accounting system <coughs> voodoo economics. I call it gobbledygook. Thank you. Thank you, Delcy. Thank you, Delcy. That would be it. Okay, we'll move on to the public hearings. First public hearing is a public hearing in which Time any resident or taxpayer of the government unit shall have an opportunity to be heard on the proposed budget. We have two people so far that have asked to be heard. Mike Burnett. Mike, we already have your address and things, so thank you. Okay. Me. Um, I don't have much to say because the bottom line is I don't really know how to respond. It's like walking to a restaurant, they give you a menu and it says food on it. It's like you want food or no. I mean, there's a budget there, but there's no items on it. And it's like, but if I was a gambling man, I'd roll on public safety, just give everybody batting helmets and some safety gloves, maybe steel toe shoes. That seems to be the bulk of all our budget there. And it's like, but overall, I know our budget is relatively tight in this town. It's the way it is but I'd like to be able to see a little expansion. And I understand with a lot of stuff, it's like, I don't know if we're competing with Sheboygan Falls and it's secret information or whatever, but in the days of the internet, that stuff can be spun out there pretty quick. And then people would really have a clue what's going on. And I know it opens a can of worms, but so be it. And that's all I got other than that, that was freaking awesome, Frank. And I would like two Ginsu knives. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. The next person signed up is Maeve Quinn. <coughs> Good evening, Mayor Van Akron, Aldermen and citizens. 
Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak at the public hearing of the budget of the city of Sheboygan. Dave, could, could you speak a little more into the, there you go, thank you. Sorry about that, thank you. Um, these last few years have not been easy for our city to create a budget that reflects the needs and wants of its citizens. Tonight, I'd like to share with you my own perspective of, <clears throat> excuse me, of this city. 20 years ago, my husband and I chose to live in the city of Sheboygan. Today, we are still choosing to live in the city of Sheboygan because we strongly believe that the taxes we pay support the services that we need. We value the strong public safety of police and fire, Mead Public Library, local parks, clean, drinkable water, the transit service, garbage, garbage pickup service, and the snow removal service. Now, I hope because I said the word snow in October, I haven't made that happen for tomorrow. So thank goodness this is made out of wood. We've <clears throat> a few weeks ago, UW Sheboygan interviewed several potential dean candidates. They came from all over. I was invited to provide one of the candidates with a short driving tour of the city of Sheboygan. We were encouraged to show off the best of the city. Before beginning the tour, I had asked him if there was anything in particular that he really want, wanted to see. He promptly asked to see our library, some of our neighborhoods, and Lake Michigan. You can probably imagine where this person was probably from, not around here. Uh, this really made me smile, and I asked him why he wanted to focus on these areas. He shared that one of the ways he judges communities is how they value their local <coughs> library and how they value their, their unique natural resources. <clears throat> he was astonished by the incredible open access for all to enjoy Lake Michigan. I did the real slow drive from the south side and all the way up. Um, he was also, uh, when we stopped in at the library early in the afternoon, he was quite thrilled to see over 100 citizens of all ages utilizing the library services. It was really quite fun to show off our ama amazing city. As all of you already know, our citizens of the city of Sheboygan certainly value their Mead Public Library. Over 32,000 people hold library cards, 32,000 citizens. Over 120 citizens visit the library every single hour. Over 800,000 items were checked out in this past year. And of those that were checked out, 73% of those items were city of Sheboygan residents. This is quite extraordinary. Our citizens truly value and utilize this public service. All of us working together promises a strong future for Mead Public Library. Thank you. Thank you, Maeve. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to be heard? Can you state your name and address for the clerk, please? Kathy Norman, 3217 North 6th. I'm sorry, 3217? 3217 North 6th. Okay. Um, I came to speak in support also of the library. Um, normally one would make comments in response to a very tangible budget proposal. This one's been a little bit circuitous. I don't even quite know how to respond. Other than to say, I know right now the library isn't seem to be facing any significant cuts, but I know anything can happen, so I would remiss if I didn't act on behalf of the library. I'm on the library board, as well as the library foundation board, and one of my roles is to be an advocate for the library. So I thought you should hear that there are still lots of people out in the community agitating to support the library that would be very unhappy if the city council didn't support it to the level it's been supported before. Um, we have lots of essential services that you support, but I can't think of one that's more tangible when you've got more than half of your population with library cards. And if you spend any time at the library, I hope all of you do, but it is a beehive of activity 24-7. I have never been there when it isn't just humming. Um, I'm there probably four or five days a week. I've gotten a lot of parking tickets there. I always spend more time inside than I think I'm going to and my meter runs out, but it is always, always busy. Um, I, one story I like to tell people is that I had an um, old professor from Northwestern University come up. She was trying to solicit uh, support for a new program at Northwestern, and she came early um, to our meeting, and she killed some time at the library before we had our appointment. And when we got together, she said, I just spent two hours at your library, and I cannot believe what an incredible facility that is. She said, for a community this size, I am so impressed. 
And I thought, that, you know, that made me proud about living in Sheboygan, and we need to keep that going. That's what keeps our downtown vibrant. It can be a fairly, you know, not so exciting downtown, but I think the library is the tenant or the, the anchor of that downtown. So I would urge you to support it to the level you always have um, and to give it your utmost uh, support. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Anyone else wishing to be heard? Anyone else wishing to be heard? Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move we close the hearing. It's been moved and seconded to close the hearing be closed. Clerk will call the roll. Fifteen ayes. Motion carries. Second hearing tonight is a public hearing amending the zoning map for property located at 2013 South 13th Street from Class NR Neighborhood Residential to Class Neighborhood Commercial Classification. Is there anyone here to be heard on that hearing? Is there anyone here for the second hearing? Is there anyone here for the second hearing? Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move we close the hearing. Second. Been moved and seconded to close the hearing. Clerk will call the roll. 15 ayes. Motion carried. Move on to the consent agenda. 3 1 through 3 19. Alderman Hammond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Please bear with my voice. Uh, motion to accept and file all ROs, accept and adopt all RCs, pass all the resolutions, pass all ordinances, and substitute of substitute ordinances. Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass all committee reports, pass all ROs, pass all resolutions and substitute resolutions. Alderman Carlson. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to pull 318 for a separate vote. We will move on 318 first. Alderman Carlson, any discussion or just? I guess the uh, an explanation of what 318 is, it's um, bringing back the uh, overtime compensation only on the holidays. Uh, last time we had a, dis uh, a brief discussion on the uh, va vacation, which were the benefit days. Um, so they were removed and this would take effect uh, at the beginning of the year. Ar Alderman Carlson. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. I can't support this, um, mainly because I, I don't think we should be paying overtime for hours not worked. Um, I, I don't think I should really have to say more than that. Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm not going to support this either, but I wish uh, if our HR manager or Mr. Amodio could explain the financial implications of this uh, if it does pass. HR director, I see is headed on the way up here, so. Sandy? Good evening. Financial impact would be approximately 75,000. We had anticipated if we had included vacation and holiday, it'd be about 100,000. The holiday schedules, if you can imagine, we can't move or juggle schedules. The garbage still has to be picked up. So that's the majority of that cost, about 75000 Any other questions, Alderman Carlson? Anybody else have any I, questions? I do, of <coughs> Mr. Mayor. Director. I have a question. Is the 75000 part of the already existing money that we're paying, or are we paying an additional 75000 Because right now we're it paying would, it at straight time no matter what. We're paying Is, it at straight time, so we figured that would be additional costs. Okay, so if we were paying $10 an hour for straight time and, f and $15 an hour for overtime, it would be that extra $5 would add up to another $75,000. Thank you. Any other questions of the HR director? Thank you, Sandy. Alderman Riesler, we need a motion then on, the, on 318. Thanks. I would uh, move that the uh, report of committee be accepted and adopted. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the committee report be accepted and adopted. Any other discussion? Hearing none, the clerk will call the, oh, I'm sorry. sorry, hang on. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. And, and I believe, um, what was the second part, Alderman Hammond? 
Subs of subs. Pass the substitute. And, and then I just have a couple comments on it as well. I, I understand that, that um, you don't want to pay for work that isn't done, but unfortunately, uh, as we go back and I talk about the private sector, uh, if we're calling somebody on a Saturday to come into work uh, or on a Sunday, we're, we're, we're paying them extra money. Uh, unfortunately, we're putting these people out uh, to do this and work an extra day during the week, and right now they're uh, being compensated at straight time. And, and again, I go back to the private uh, sector where they would be compensated at additional time. Um, it was a 5 nothing vote at the committee, and um, like I said, I, I think that uh, we have an obligation to our employees. Um, as the gentleman who presented the Act 10, um, this is somewhat of a compromise with the employees to um, get from where we were to where we are now. Thank you. Mayor Carlson. Thank you, Mayor. I, I work in the private sector full time, and when I take, uh, let's say, Labor Day off, I get paid my eight hours holiday pay. I work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and I usually have to go in on Saturday. I work my 40 hour work week. I do not get paid overtime for that eight hours on Saturday because it's still within my 40 hours. If I were to happen to work over 48 hours to include my holiday pay, then I would get overtime. So you can't blanket say that everything in the private sector pays overtime for that extra day worked. Thank you. Any other discussion? Hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. That was fast. <laughs> Apparently. Seven eyes, eight no's. Motion fails. I'm going to leave it up for a couple of minutes. Hold on. Okay. We'll take on everything <coughs> on the consent agenda except 318. Now we had a motion to accept all the RCs, all the committee reports, all the reports of all sorts of. <coughs> Resolutions and substitute resolutions be put upon their passage. Any discussion on anything else? Okay. Clerk will call the roll. Fifteen ayes. Motion carried. Four one report of officers from the plan commission recommending. Uh, amending the zoning of property located at 3711 South Taylor will lie over. 4-2 will be referred. 4-3 has been withdrawn. Communication. 4-4 four, four will be referred and 4-5 will be referred. 5-1 resolutions introduced by Alderman Heideman, authorizing purchasing agent to prepare and issue a request for proposals for rehabilitation of city-owned shanty at 705 Riverfront Drive. Alderman Heideman. Thank you, Mayor. I put the resolution upon its passage. It's Second. been moved and seconded to have the resolution be put upon its passage. <coughs> Under discussion, Alderman Under Heideman. discussion, no, since the process uh, of, and this uh, body decided that they wanted to save the shanty, we gotta find out what's all involved and in, 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 uh, get a cost, effective cost of what it was gonna to cost to save that shanty. So this is a, the starting process and this will come back to public works, so. Thank you. Any other discussion? Alderman Donahue. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I'm gonna support this uh, uh, resolution. Um, my concern is um, as you read through it, you realize that it is an extremely detailed plan, uh, request for proposal for a detailed overhaul and um, a reconstruction of the shanty. Now, um, the detail is exquisite. It is probably necessary. Um, my concern is that in some fashion or another, this request for proposal by the nature of its um, substantial detail will discourage or somehow derail any other development efforts that might be happening with the shanty. <clears throat> now, the reason I'll support it, however, is my understanding that if there are requests for proposal that actually do meet all of the details of this uh, particular um, uh, resolution, that will go back to public works. If there's not, that will also go back to Public Works. In other words, by passing this, we are not 
closing the door on those folks who may be interested in preserving the shanty and, and who come up with an alternate plan that may not necessarily meet with the detail of the, of the RFP. So it has my support, but with that understanding. Thank you. Alderman Bourne. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor Van Akron. I understand from the last council meeting that there's a redevelopment authority meeting coming up. Is it the 18th of this month? How is that, how is that meeting, uh, is, that, is this uh, fish shanty thing going to be on that agenda? And are there going to be any proposals coming forward from the private sector other than the original one we had where the person wanted to invest $200,000? Then Mr. Dolson had a supposed businessman who was interested in coming forth and restoring this. Where does this uh, redevelopment authority meeting coming up in a few days fit into this equation? I don't believe it does figure into the equation because we didn't transfer the property to the redevelopment authority. So it's still under the city council uh, and the city's control. So we'd be um, looking at proposals, not the redevelopment authority because we never transferred the property, correct? That's, that's correct. And there is nothing on the agenda for the October 18th meeting with regard to the shanty. Uh, from redevelopment standpoint, Redevelopment Authority doesn't have any jurisdiction over the shanty issue at this point. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other discussion? <coughs> Do you none? The clerk will call the roll. 15 ayes. Motion carries. By through a resolution by 5-2, a resolution by Alderman Vandewilly, Matichek, Koth, Lewandowski, authorizing the city attorney to engage in outside legal services with regard to a quasi-judicial hearing regarding the suspension and rev revocation of a cigarette tobacco license number 1406. Alderman Mandewilly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to suspend the rules. Second. It's been moved and seconded to suspend the rules. Discussion under the suspension. Who seconded it? I'm sorry. Thank you. Check. We'll first vote on the suspension of the rules. Bill. Thank you. 13 ayes, 2 noes. Rules are suspended. Alderman Vanderwilly. I move to put the resolution upon its passage. Second. It's been moved and seconded to have the resolution be put upon its passage. Under discussion, Alderman Vanderwilly. Um, a little bit of history here. We, this has come before the committee or the council before. Um, I'm going to go back to the beginning. On August 14th, the committee was advised by Sergeant Zempel that Tidy Carr had sold tobacco to a minor through the WINS program. Uh, it was voted to uh, 4 to 0 to call um, the license holder into law and licensing. On August 28th, Joseph Jantz appeared before the committee. Um, there was a, quite a bit of discussion. Um, the first motion was made by Alderman Lassard and seconded by Matichek to issue a warning. After discussion, the motion was withdrawn. Then Alderman Matichek moved to suspend for five days and it failed for a second. Alderman Lassard and Vanderweel moved to issue a warning and there was two ayes and two nays, so the motion failed. After more discussion, Alderman Lewandowski and Matichek requested a 15-day suspension, which was later amended for 10 days, and it was approved three to one. On September 11th, Joseph Jantz denied the offer to close for 10 days and requested a quasi-judicial hearing. On September 17th, council denied funding for the represent representation of the committee for the quasi-judicial hearing. For the October 9th, 2012 meeting, I asked that the motion to rescind be placed on the agenda. At that meeting, I made a motion to rescind the motion from August 28, 2012, and the motion died for lack of a second. Um, based on that, the, we have to have a quasi-judicial hearing. We have no choice. Um, we've, we've done all that we can to um, avoid it based on the council denying uh, funding last time. So we submitted another document, and we're not asking the council if they agree with what we're doing with you know having the quasi, there is no, agreeing with that right now. All we're asking is that um, the five of us who are on the committee have representation when we are doing this judicial hearing. Thank you. Alderman Raisler. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I supported this last time and I think um, Alderman Donahue elegant, elegantly um, 
spoke on it and basically said we, we, <coughs> we need to have some representation for this hearing. We're kind of putting ourselves out there as a, as a city as a whole if we're, we're not going to provide this committee um, with the ability to succeed. So I, I'll support it again. Thank you. And remember, everybody, that this hearing will be not just the committee, but the 16 of you will be. It's just the committee. Well, I'm sorry, just, just the committee. And, and that they will need then somebody, <coughs> because Steve will be um, acting as the prosecutor. Steve, maybe you can explain a little more. Yeah, our office, and it would be uh, Assistant City Attorney Adams, would be presenting the case for uh, the recommendation of the Law and Licensing Committee, suspension of the license. Um, and the outside counsel would be representing the, uh, the Law and Licensing Committee members who are acting basically as uh, the judge at, at that hearing uh, <clears throat> and providing legal assistance to that committee in, uh, in, during the proceeding. Uh, the committee would hold the hearing, uh, develop, uh, come up with the, the recommendation, develop findings of fact and conclusions of law, and those would be presented to the council as a recommendation, and uh, then the council would act on uh, basically the, the written findings of fact and conclusions of law that uh, had been presented by the Law and Licensing Committee during the quasi-judicial hearing. Steve, I know you can't give an exact number, but approximately what kind of dollars are we talking about? Um, you know, it's, it's impossible to say with any precision, but typically it's been a couple hundred dollars is uh, what it's run. Typically we've hired uh, Joe Volkner from the Olson Clowett firm and uh, you know what it would depend on the amount of time that the hearing took he basically charges i don't know I can't quote his fee 180 dollars an hour or something like that but basically it's the time he would devote to the hearing um, i don't think that there's a lot of prep time that he will need to do or anything like that and uh, our office would do most of the legwork as far as the findings of fact, conclusions of law, and that sort of thing. So uh, it's a matter of just being present at the, uh, at the hearing. Thank you. Any other discussion? Hearing none, clerk. Oh. Alderman Bellinger. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a question for Steve. If, if this doesn't pass, this hearing still takes place without representation. Is that correct? I mean, if, or, does the hearing not take place if it doesn't yeah. pass? Well, that's the issue we had last time. I, I guess that will be up to the Law and Licensing Committee, but I would assume that they would hold the hearing and uh, uh, go without legal representation as far as uh, hearing the case. It raises concerns about if there are any objections made during the hearing as far as evidentiary sorts of issues, uh, whether witnesses were subpoenaed if uh, somebody was requesting subpoenaed witnesses things like that that uh, would go unaddressed but but uh, I would assume that the committee would proceed with the hearing in any event any other questions Alderman Bellin no Alderman Van de Willey. we would have to go c continue with the quasi judicial hearing um, because I did have the motion or tried to have the motion to rescind um, when I made the motion, I needed one of the other two who voted for the quasi to um, second, and neither one of them that did. So we could do the same thing over again, but really we need to just go on with this quasi, regardless of if we have representation or not. Alderman Riesler. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, trying to help Alderman Heidemann, who doesn't know how to use the buttons. So I figured oh, his button's not working. <laughs> Thank you, Alderman. We, we no, turned no, it off on no, purpose, no, Joe. No, it comes on. Thank you very much. I, again, I'm not going to support this. Um, I do compliment the chairman of the committee for offering up a, an opportunity for this uh, process to go away, but not getting a second from two aldermen. Uh, evidently, they have got something that uh, for some reason didn't understand that when the council last time did not want to fund the quasi-district, the, the attorney said, hey, 
maybe this isn't the right place, right way to go. Give this gentleman a warning, and get it over with. They could have easily done that at that committee, but they just decided not to. And again, I don't see spending two hundred or three hundred dollars on representation to give to try to pull somebody's license that the, the actual clerk only got a warning, and then they want to hang the, the business owner. Alderman Donahue. Well, <clears throat> I appreciate the uh, procedural <coughs> review. Um, this is actually uh, appears to have gotten to be a fairly complicated matter. I'm speaking up just because this is what my mom would call penny wise and pound foolish. We are proposing to take away livelihood from the business owner. We can do that. But that business owner is entitled to due process of law. Now, <clears throat> I have acted as such a hearing officer in other hearings and other galaxies, and I can tell you that the services rendered are important. Number one, the hearing officer assists the committee in making sure that proper evidence is, is admitted and improper evidence is excluded. It makes sure that the committee is focused and directed when it is making its decision. It advises the committee if it has a tendency to consider factors that a circuit court or the Court of Appeals or the Wisconsin Supreme Court would consider improper, it advises the committee to, to avoid those kinds of considerations. We just need to do this. <laughs> we have a structure in place. This would be like saying, you know that speeding ticket, you know the officer was really right, and mm, let's, Let's have a hearing and let's just invite a couple of people in, um, let's, in municipal court. Let's invite the, the alderman in to make that decision and not have a judge make that decision. It's, it's just not proper. This is something we have to do. Now, what if we don't do it and the committee goes ahead? God willing, and the creeks don't rise, everything goes well. A good decision is made and things are, are, are uh, processed and you know, whatever happens will happen. If things don't go well, $200 will seem like a blessing compared to the attorney fees that the city will expend defending itself at the circuit court level and or the Court of Appeals, unlikely the Wisconsin Supreme Court. But let me just say it because I'm a little excited about this. I, I really think that this is something that we need to approve. It, it is just what makes this a democracy and a judicial system, a quasi-judicial system, which is fair and impartial and that our citizens can rely on. Thank you, Alderman Donahue. Any other discussion? Alderman Lassard. Thank you, Mayor. I sit on this committee and I was not in favor of um, taking this man's license away for 10 days, but I'm also not in favor of having this procedure happen without legal advice. So I would like to ask you all to support the funding we need so we can get the facts on the table and do it in a proper manner with legal counsel. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Lassar. Any other discussion? Hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Ten eyes, five noes. Motion carries. <coughs> five three, five four, and five five will lie over. Five six and five seven will be referred. Six one report a committee from salary and grievance recommending the current job, current chief administrator's officer's job description be approved. Alderman Reisler. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the uh, report of committee be accepted and adopted. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the RO be accepted and adopted. Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mayor Van Akron. When I read over this document, this job description, I read it over very closely, and I found one thing that I thought was a little inconsistent. It may be, uh, but what I'm going to recommend just follows with the rest of the document in here. The, the majority of the document says, uh, for example, under number two, common council with the input of the mayor. Then when you go to the uh, chief administrative officer's supervisory responsibilities, uh, that first sentence says, carries out 
supervisory responsibilities in accordance with the city policies and applicable laws. Responsibilities include hiring of employees, planning and directing work in consultation with the mayor. Uh, I would like to make a motion to strike in consultation with the mayor and put in there with input from the mayor. This just follows around, along with the language from the rest of the document and makes it consistent throughout. So I'd like to make that motion. I'll second. So move and seconded to amend the document to have input from the mayor instead of whatever the current is. With input, uh, strike in consultation with the mayor and put in with input from the mayor. Does everybody understand the amendment? We'll vote on the amendment first. The clerk will call the roll. Hang on. Mary Lynn? Oh, sorry. That's okay. 13 ayes, 2 noes. Motion carries. Now back to the original as amended. Uh, sorry, clerk will call the roll. Fourteen eyes, one no. <coughs> Motion carries. <coughs> Six two from Long Licensing recommending taxi driver license number ninety four ninety one be denied based upon her record. Alderman Vandewilly. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Mayor. I move the RC be accepted and adopted. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the RC be accepted and adopted. Under discussion, Alderman Vandewilly. Is Regina Ramirez here this evening? She is here. Um, she revealed all of her convictions to the committee. <coughs> uh, the committee was concerned about a two thousand eleven inattentive driving. Um, after uh, Regina had told us a little bit more as to what happened, uh, there was an accident that occurred due to a flashback she was having from a previous accident, um, and it was severe enough that her car was completely totaled. Um, there was also concern for a 2012 noise disturbance and disorderly conduct. Um, it happened at the same time. It was, um, and it was between her and the downstairs neighbor. And the police had concerns overall about um, maybe her recollection of the events as to um, it, it didn't go along with their normal procedure. Would the applicant like to address the council? Can you give your name and address for the clerk, please? Regina Ramirez, 1218 Superior Avenue. Thank you. Um, I was just letting the council know to re, um, look at my case or open up and actually see what really happened. I'm not sure exactly what they're saying happened because I didn't go into my record. I don't know what the police said. I haven't went back that far. I did have an accident, and I told them, you know, what happened. It was not a child that was coming out. It was a bush that was underneath my car, and it was an accident. Um, it was, I believe, in 2011, I believe, and a little boy shot out, darted out between two cars. I stopped, but the little boy still hit my car, and it really scared me. I kind of went into shock and I was afraid to drive. And because I was afraid to drive, I put myself and went to the doctor and said, you know what, I'm scared. And they said, what, what are you scared of? I said, I'm scared to drive. And she said, what do you mean? I said, when I get into the car, I get panicky, I'm scared, I start shaking. And she said it was anxiety. So she referred me to Winnebago Mental Health Clinic. I took the precautions that I had to, I completed everything I had to. They took me off everything I had to do and proceeded with everything they told me to do. This was more than, what, this is 2012 already. 
This was in 2011. So it's over a year and a half ago. This happened in June with the little boy. In August, I still wasn't driving. I was scared. As Soon as I saw like little bush like running underneath the, the I, I didn't know it was a bush. I, I saw something coming out. I hit the brakes. There was water. I slipped. I lost control of my vehicle. I did, it was an accident. Everybody could have an accident. There was a tree bush underneath my vehicle. You know, everybody could have an accident. So I'm hoping you guys will reconsider and look at my case, go through it if you have to thoroughly, and make a decision. I'm hoping that you guys do that. And um, I would like my license back. I've been driving for about three months. Um, well, I've been driving with a taxi company for three months. I've been driving myself for six months. Um, never had an accident. I'm more precautious now. I'm very, very aware of when I see little kids. I do not like to go by the schools because I'm afraid of that happening. But anybody would be if that would happen to you because he was a little child. You know, he was like nobody would have saw him. It was two cars. There was an accident. I was in the newspaper. It was at a church. We were coming out of church. Stuff happens. We just don't know why it happens to good people. Thank you. I have Any no record, nothing at all. I did have a disorderly conduct. I do. But unfortunately, I have bad people that I had an ex-boyfriend that has a very mean ex-girlfriend and their mother, and that's who lived underneath me. So I'm cursed with an ex-boyfriend that had a mean mother. So I broke up with him, and now I have no problems. It's over. Any questions of the applicant? Questions of the applicant? Alderman Bourne. No, not of the applicant. Oh, OK. Any questions of the applicant? Alderman Vanderwood. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the noise disturbance and disorderly conduct that occurred in 2012? Yes. Um, I used to work for a little boy for Sheboygan County Health and Human Services. I can't give him his last name, but I can give you his first name. His name was Jerry. He is, um, like, he can't walk very well. Well, he got up to go to the restroom. I told the police this. I told him to come upstairs. He didn't want to come upstairs. Um, they called the police because there was stomping. He stomped up. He got up and stomped all the way to the bathroom. Well, my next door neighbor, well, my downstairs neighbor, which is my ex boyfriend's mother-in-law, ex now, called the police and said we were stomping around. And I told him, come up. And I said, I was going to take it to court, but she went, she moved to Iowa. So I wasn't able even to take it to court. So I just paid my ticket and did what I had to do. But I have paperwork on him where he, you know, I take him to the doctor and everything. He was living with me for over six months. Alderman Van Der Willen. Uh, you'd also received a disorderly conduct that same evening? Yes, it was his, her daughter. Her daughter came screaming, trying to push into my house, calling me all names. I pushed the door, and I slammed the door, and it hit her in her face. And she was screaming at me, I'm not going to let someone come into my house. Especially her daughter. She don't even live there. It wasn't even the lady that lives downstairs. It was her daughter. Any other questions of the applicant? Any other questions? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Chairman Vanderweel, uh, <coughs> what was the uh, vote of the committee, and did you get any recommendation from the police department on this? The committee denied um, her request for a license five to zero, and the police department, um, what he had told us was um, to get a disorderly conduct, it, Typically, there'd be more to it than just slamming the door, as well as the noise disturbance. So he was, without having the police report in front of him, he was um, just said it didn't sound completely like the full story. Any other questions? Any other discussion? Alderman Donahue? 
<clears throat> Just a point of information. Um, at what point could um, an applicant make a new application for a license if, if she's denied? Anytime. Anytime? And is there a typical rule of thumb about how long a person needs to wait in order for an application to be favorably considered? A year. A year. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, clerk will call the roll. Eleven eyes, four no's. Motion carries. Six three report a committee from finance recommending establishing policy for fund balances for self insurance health insurance fund and self insurance worker compensation fund. Alderman Hammond. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to accept and adopt and pass the resolution. Right. It's been moved and seconded to accept and adopt and, and pass the resolution. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. Joe. Fifteen ayes. Motion carried. Seven one ordinance amending various sections of the municipal cord will lie over. Eight one on our roll. <coughs> City Plan Commission recommending approval of changing of zoning map for property located at 2013 South 13th Street. Alderman Koff. Thank you, Mary Van Eckeren. I move that the RO be accepted and adopted and pass the ordinance. It's been moved and seconded that the RO be accepted and adopted and pass the resolution. Second. Seconded was by. Second. Oh, are you seconding? Sure. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. 15 ayes. Motion carried. 8-2 resolution by Alderman Hammond approving the sale of certain redevelopment authority property. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that we pass the resolution. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the resolution be put upon its passage. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, clerk will call the roll. Fifteen ayes. Motion carried. Eight three resolution from Alderman Hammond amending resolution three fourteen thirty five twelve thirteen by Alderman Heidemann passed on July sixteenth two thousand and twelve. Alderman Hammond. Actually, it's Alderman Heideman. Oh, I'm sorry, Alderman Heideman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I move that the resolution be put upon its passage. Second. Been moved and seconded that the resolution be put upon its passage. Under discussion, Alderman okay. Heideman. Um, back in July, we passed this resolution, and since then, there's been an addition of $5,000, so we need to repass the resolution. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, clerk will call the roll. Motion carried. 9 1 under other matters will be referred to finance under other matters, city attorney. <coughs> 9 point 2 is an RO by the city clerk submitting various license applications for the period ending June 30, 2013 and June 30, 2014. That will go to law and licensing. 9.3 is an RO by the purchasing agent submitting a recommendation for award of bid number 1734-12 for the purchase of three vehicles for the transit department. That will go to finance. 9.4 is a resolution authorizing the purchasing agent to enter into contract for the purchase of those three vehicles for the transit department. That will go to finance. 9.5 is a resolution authorizing the appropriate city officials to execute an application for an aquatic invasive species control grant for the city. Uh, the grant is between the Department of Natural Resources and the city, in the amount up to $20,000 for the implementation of invasive species control near North Point Park. Public Works. 9.6 is a resolution to authorize the transfer of appropriations in the 2012 budget. Finance. 
9.7 is an RO by the city clerk submitting a notice of claim from Castor Law Offices on behalf of their client, Sandra Bear. That will also go to finance. 10 1, motion to go into closed session. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, move to convene in closed session or the exemption provided in section 19.851E, Wisconsin statutes, for the purpose of discussion and formulation of negotiation strategies relative to possible agreement for combining emergency dispatch services where competitive and bargaining reasons require a closed session. Second. And moved and seconded to go into closed session. Clerk will call the roll. <coughs> 14 ayes, one no. We will go into, <laughs> we will take a five minute break and go into closed session. We will not come back <laughs> out into open session. <laughs> 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 